1814, 200 men crossed the lush Kedu plains of central Java to search out a legendary mountain near the small village of Boro. For six weeks, they slash and burn the choking vegetation. They clear away tons of volcanic ash. Hidden beneath the debris, they find strange figures carved in stone. Thousands of them. It is said that a heavenly architect built the mountain of a thousand statues in a single day and laid a curse on anyone who dared ascend his holy shrine to see them. Javanese records show that in 1758, a rebellious young prince of Jogjakarta defied the curse. When the prince returned home, he was stricken with a sudden illness and died. The excavation of the monument known as Borobudur had been ordered by Sir Thomas Stanford Raffles, the new British governor of Java. Unlike the Dutch traders before him, Raffles is intrigued by the exotic stories and architecture of the Indonesian islands. The antiquities of Java have not, till lately, excited much notice, nor have they yet been sufficiently explored. The pursuits of commerce have been too exclusive to allow there being much interest in the subject. When Raffles comes to inspect the progress of his expedition, he finds a colossal pyramid rising to a huge bell-shaped pinnacle. The ruin of Barabador is remarkable for its grandeur in design. The building is square and composed of terraces rising one within the other each enclosed by stone walls. On the walls are carved in the most beautiful style panels containing historical scenes and ceremonies. Nearly 3,000 panels encircle the monument. Indigenous plant life is depicted in such detail that specific species can be identified. Methods of rice farming remain unchanged. Javanese animals share the walls with mythological creatures. There are scenes of abundance and joyful celebration. All evidence of a once thriving culture. Borobudur illustrates the patronage which the arts and sciences must have received and the inexhaustible wealth and resources which the Javanese of those times must have possessed.
In a time long before Europeans discovered the Spice Islands, great Javanese ships sailed the seas. They carried tons of rice and hardwoods from the fertile island to the ports of Malaysia, China, and India in exchange for the exotic provisions of a prosperous existence. But by Raffles time, the glory of Java has faded and no one can remember when or why Borabudur had been built. The natives have long ceased to respect the temples and idols of former worship, though they still view the ruins with superstitious reverence. The Javanese had been converted to Islam during the 15th century, and Raffles thinks it unlikely that Barabadur would have been built since then. Records also show that in the 10th century, the region had been mysteriously deserted. Perhaps the nearby Mount Merapi had erupted, choking the ricelands with layers of volcanic ash. Whatever the cause, the population moved to East Java in a mass exodus, and Barabadur was left behind. Lacking further historical evidence, Raffles is unable to determine the exact date of Barabadur's construction. But he does have some insight into the purpose of the structure. The resemblance of the images which surround this temple to the figure of Buddha has introduced an opinion that Barabadur was exclusively confined to the worship of that deity. As word of the discovery spreads, scholars of Asian religions visit. They recognize Barabadur as the largest Buddhist temple in the world and the most unique. In ancient times, pilgrims may have come from all over Southeast Asia to study at Barabadur. The panels depict the teachings of the Buddha. Each familiar story, a step in the pilgrim's progress. Each terrace, a higher plane of consciousness. There is no central sanctuary in this temple. Instead, the more than three miles of galleries that ring the structure are designed to guide the faithful on a spiritual journey. Borobudur is a three-dimensional road map to enlightenment. The Buddha was once reborn as a woodpecker. One day he met a lion who had a bone caught in his throat and was suffering horribly. The woodpecker propped open the lion's mouth with a bit of wood and walked into it to remove the bone. Though the woodpecker was very hungry, the lion would not share any of his meal. This saddened the woodpecker. But he did not take revenge. Good deeds do not necessarily occasion any reward other than the pleasure of doing someone else a good turn. Ascending the eastern stairway to the first gallery, pilgrims follow the journey of the Buddha through his 500 earthly reincarnations. The future Buddha can be reborn as a king, he can be reborn as an animal, he can be reborn as a monk, all kinds of possibilities. But each time that he is reborn, he practices all kinds of good deeds.
repetition is essential. 500 times the message has to be repeated, repeated, repeated. And in all these existences, he accumulates all the merit, all the wisdom, all the insight that he needs to come well prepared into his last earthly existence, which is the existence as the Prince Siddhartha, who becomes the Buddha. The panels then chronicle the experiences of the young prince as he travels for the first time beyond the palace walls. Once outside, Siddhartha encounters the harsh realities of the world. He sees sickness and death. And he begins to realize that life is suffering and that there must be a way out of this. Siddhartha comes to understand that all suffering is caused by unfulfilled desire. Only by extinguishing desire does he achieve enlightenment and become the Buddha. The panels of the next three tiers of Borobudur tell the story of a young disciple named Sudana. He serves as a role model for those who wish to learn the teachings of the Buddha. And so he goes from one teacher to the other, a ship's captain, a banker, nuns, monks, two kings, even the god Shiva is among them. Each one of them gives him a little piece of the truth. At the end of his life, the Buddha's disciples asked him what kind of monument he'd like built in his memory. The Buddha replied, a stupa. The disciples were mystified. What is a stupa, one asked. In answer, the Buddha overturned his alms bowl and stood his walking stick on top of it. When Sudana is ready to leave his teachers and pass beyond the world of existence, he enters the realm of contemplation, and the pilgrim ascends from the cluttered galleries to the expansive upper terraces. A huge stupa crowns Borobudur. Within the 72 surrounding stupas, the pilgrim finds the Buddha in sublime meditation. This stark contrast between the phenomenal world and the ethereal world of formlessness at the top is one of the most brilliant inventions of the architects of Borobudur. Despite Raffles' best intentions, uncovering Borobudur has placed it in grave danger, as reports of the exotic temple attract a new breed of pilgrim. Souvenir hunters decapitate many of the Buddhas and ship them to mansions and museums throughout the world. For the weary tourist, a tea house is built high on the crumbling central stupa. Many of the Europeans who came to Asia, and many of the Asians themselves because they had been converted to Islam, regarded these monuments as the work of heathen. And this prevented them from appreciating their true beauty. But in 1885, an accidental discovery rekindles interest in preserving this ancient treasure. J.W. Iserman, a Dutch architect involved in a restoration project, walks along the high processional path that surrounds the base of Borobudur. 
and he noticed that the moldings of the wall continued underneath a crack that he saw in the floor. This meant that all these stones must have been added at a time when part of the building was already finished. Eisenman excitedly calls for a section of the path to be removed. When 16 layers of stone have been pulled away, Eisenman discovers another tier of panels, quite unlike those of the upper galleries. These are portrayals of hellish tortures, mixed with scenes of sweet pleasures. In all, 160 panels are uncovered. But it is not until the hidden panels are linked to the Buddhist doctrine of karma that their significance is understood. These are the ground rules of what happens to you, you know, whether you are reborn as a human, as an animal, in hell or in heaven. It is the cosmic law of cause and effect. Saying ugly things about others in this life results in rebirth as an ugly person. Those who mistreat animals will be trampled by elephants. The dishonest will be tortured with a hot iron. It also goes in the positive way. If you donate a bell to a temple, in your next incarnation, you will have a melodious voice. Eisenman finds that a few scenes have been left unfinished, with instructions to the stone carver inscribed in Sanskrit. The style of lettering is so distinctive that it can be dated to the middle of the 9th century. Experts conclude that Barabadur must have been built by the Selendra kings who ruled in central Java at that time. But why had they covered the laws of karma, the foundation of Buddhist belief? Some people think there is a symbolic reason. I tend to think that it was as they were building the monument, it started sagging, and in order to keep it in place, they built this heavy stone ring around the monument. Eisenman reaches the same conclusion. After photographing the panels, he replaces the original pathway to restabilize the structure. But as Barabador's past becomes more clear, its future grows much less certain. The sediment and plant life that had shrouded Barabador for so many centuries had also protected it from the elements. As the galleries are cleared, the porous volcanic stone is exposed to Java's relentless heat and torrential downpours. Nature itself is destroying the monument. Water seeps through the cracks, undermining the temple's earthen core, buckling floors, pushing out walls. Half an hour after a heavy rainfall, all the water came out, uh, depositing all kinds of sediment on the stones, which led to the growth of all kinds of lichen and mosses and whatnot. And the monument was in pretty bad shape. Throughout most of the 19th century, Borobudur suffers more damage than in the thousand years before. In 1907, Theodore van Erp, a Dutch engineering officer, leads a major restoration project. He 
He rebuilds the crumbling stupas and heaving floors of the upper terraces. But after four years, the limited funds are exhausted before work can begin on the lower galleries. Carvings are now rapidly disintegrating. Walls are crumbling. And the whole structure is in danger of tumbling down the hill in one enormous archaeological avalanche. But it would be several decades before attention would again turn to Barabador. There was once a terrible drought. And a Brahmin told the king he would have to sacrifice 100 living beings to bring it to an end. Unable to do this, the king proclaimed that he would select the necessary victims from among his worst subjects. At this news, his subjects all became virtuous, and the drought stopped. In 1968, the Indonesian government and the United Nations, working through UNESCO, launch a campaign to save Borobudur. Over the next 15 years, $20 million are raised to support a bold plan, the complete dismantling and reconstruction of the lower terraces, stone by stone. Thirteen hundred carved panels are taken apart and individually cleaned, catalogued, and treated for preservation. Over one million stones are moved during the course of restoration and set aside like pieces of a massive jigsaw puzzle. Professionals from 27 countries join their Indonesian counterparts to carry out the project. Borobudur becomes a testing ground for new conservation techniques, new procedures to battle the microorganisms eating away at the stone. Experts in engineering, chemistry, biology, and archaeology all share their skills to solve the multitude of problems. The project takes eight years of labor and unprecedented international cooperation to complete. Borobudur has served as a place of learning, dedication, and training for those who follow the path of the Buddha and those who labored to preserve this cultural treasure. According to Buddhist philosophy, such cooperation in the monumental construction effort would have earned everyone involved great merit in their quest for enlightenment. Perhaps the builders of Borobudur hoped for just such a legacy.